Commissioner, welcome to In Conversation. It's a great pleasure, thank you. Commissioner, you've talked about a new Marshall Plan being necessary to rebuild Ukraine, but who's going to pay for this plan? Does the EU budget, is your budget going to be paying for this plan? First, we have to finish the war. We have to re-establish the territorial sovereignty of uh, Ukraine. It's about uh, Ukrainian people to decide about their destiny. And then, of course, we have to make a need assessment, what is needed for the reconstruction. Um, I have to admit my more urgent, more pressing issue is uh, how to finance Ukraine as long as they are in the war. I think it's finally the only possibility to provide um, a structure which is very much based on long-term loans, which we can, as an international community, and the stress international community. Do you mean by when you say it needs to be international effort that you're saying that all of us are going to be contributing to this kind of reconstruction of Ukraine? Is that what you're saying? I think so. It, 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 it should be, it must be at least a G20 effort because everybody is benefiting from it. And that's why I think a joint effort is necessary. Uh, it cannot be stamped by, by, one, by one country. Uh, I think we have to help them in a grace period uh, to, to finance um, interests, etc. But uh, medium and long term, it can be, it can be rebate by the, by the Ukrainians themselves. But again, first is uh, to finish the war, to help Ukraine during this period, to assist them to provide military assistance, economic assistance, social assistance. And then, of course, we can go the next step. The EU Commission has carried out unprecedented sanctions against Russia's elite who are supporting Putin's war. And that includes seizing luxury yachts, beautiful estates, and even freezing accounts. Is the Commission willing to sell this to act as compensation? If it can be done, it should be done because uh, there is a, a responsibility by key figures uh, in Russia for what has happened what was possible in terms also of uh, political development inside the system. So I think if it's uh, somehow possible, it should be done. It was also in, in the history that uh, those countries uh, which have uh, triggered wars after uh, um, so a peace agreement were forced to, to, to finance also the reconstruction of those countries which are uh, so say the victims of the aggression, and therefore, I think it's it's a very understandable and and uh, necessary uh, signal uh, to consider also such measures. But would the EU, do you think, do that? I mean, you're in charge of budget, so you really would be interested in where the money's coming from. Would the EU do that on its own, or would you have to say that we are going to have to wait until the United Nations agrees to this well, as well? I think this is exactly something where the United Nations uh, might be the appropriate uh, platform. And uh, I know it from other, from other uh, similar situations where the United Nations already had the obligation to deal with this. And again, also here I see uh, the international community uh, in its duty to, to deal with it. And uh, um, we are very much committed to rule of law, talking about multilateralism and all this. So if, if we are promoting, if, if we are asking for it, we should also respect it. But you've made a comment which I, I found very interesting some years ago also. Um, one of the things that's been raised, for example, in the case of Sri Lanka, was whether or not Sri Lanka took out loans with, for example, China to build infrastructure, and that the loan, the financing, was perhaps 
not to the advantage of the country necessarily. You've called this Trojan horse type financing. You were talking about it in the context of what happened in the Balkans mm -hmm. uh, and the efforts that China was making at the time for the Belt and Road. Do you still feel that China is making Trojan horse financing? Call it Trojan horse or whatsoever. The, the, the point was definitely, and I was indeed referring to the situation, for instance, in the Western Balkans, but you can also look at Africa, that uh, provisioning of loans was not without any costs, political costs. And one can also see or ask about the added value. Uh, uh, for us, the Europeans, uh, it's extremely important that our societal concept, our way of life is respected, number one. Number two, that our companies have everywhere in the world the same level playing field than other companies have in Europe. And this is something which uh, led all our, uh, let's say, considerations. So we are very much in favor of international trade and, and all this. And uh, uh, I mean, Europe is the most uh, international uh, continent in the world in terms of foreign direct investments to Europe, but also of Europeans outside Europe. Uh, so we are the ones who are uh, quasi going international and trying to establish everywhere the necessary standards. But again, um, what we need is um, reciprocity. And this is something we, we have and we are still missing very often in our relationship uh, with uh, China and the treatment uh, European companies uh, um, see in, in China and the other way. Uh, Chinese companies and the investments, uh, on the other hand, can expect and expect in Europe. No? So your main concern really is you're saying that it doesn't give a level playing field to European or doesn't give the same access to European con uh, companies. Is that what you're saying? You yeah, don't mind and, and that China uh, does I mean, these If, if I take, for instance, the situation in, in, in Western Balkans, I mean, we have a very huge interest to develop the country, the, the countries, the regions. So we invest there not only uh, in, in kind of loans, but also providing grants. But of course, if we are offering loans, or if we are offering even more financial direct support grants, it's also linked to certain reform measures. Uh, and, and this is in the interest of a stronger rapprochement of these countries to the standards of the European Union. So we're investing into the development. If it's about Africa, our interest is to have a partnership relation on, on equal eyes. What about uh, Chinese companies in the Chinese and Beijing who, who argue that they are really doing also that as well, that they want to partner and they're helping to develop, in fact, many of the things that are being built in Africa, from ports to sports stadiums, are actually a development of these countries, much needed as well, and that in the past, European countries also gave aid and very often that aid ended up being done by some European companies as well, as part of well, it. So I, what difference I, would I, they I, ask? I don't, I don't deny that uh, we have made uh, mistakes in the past and nobody is uh, uh, free of uh, errors. Uh, important is to learn the lessons, to accept, to respect. And I think in that, in that uh, context, uh, Europe has uh, um, learned its lesson. Uh, and once again, um, it's about uh, creating um, a, a relationship of uh, uh, mutual um, so say recognition, acceptance, respect. Uh, and again, it's in our interest to invest in the development of these countries and not to uh, take out as much as possible uh, in order to serve so say, our immediate interests. We, the Europeans, are constantly confronted with migration waves. I have to admit, I'm not aware about migration waves to China. Uh, but this is another story. For us, it's important to help to, to support, uh, for instance, uh, countries in Africa to improve the, the living conditions of people, to give them a perspective, to stay in their countries, to develop it, to address the climate change, to improve education, to improve the contribution of women in the labor market. All this is for us uh, imminent uh, because we consider this as a precondition 
of a peaceful coexistence. So you're not saying that it's not because you just don't want refugees flooding into Europe and that you'd prefer them to stay in their own countries? Because you no, could what, be misinterpreted to imply no, that. Indeed, what we want is a peaceful coexistence. And this means people should have a perspective in their countries because uh, this is my experience. I was uh, five years commissioner for regional policy and I know that at least 80% of people want to stay uh, in the places where they have been born. They want to have their economic perspective, their life perspective for themselves, for their children, grandchildren. Finally, they would like to die where they have been born. And I think um, if we have, a, let's say, moral um, responsibility as politicians, we, we should support this, uh, this intention. And, and finally, it, it's also in our interest. No? For an ordinary person in, in Southeast Asia, when they look at Europe at the moment, um, they may see it as being perhaps in a rather tough situation. There's the Ukraine war. Uh, there seems to be a slowdown, but that's a global thing, of course, taking place. Everybody's only just coming out of COVID. So why should Southeast Asians want to buy European bonds? Look, the short answer is um, uh, we have always uh, managed our crisis. So we have a good track record. Uh, and Europe always grew as a result of crisis. I mean, two years ago, nobody ever considered that Europe as a, as a supranational will deal with uh, health issues. Uh, it's also according to our treat in the, in the mere responsibility of member states. But today, we are talking about um, a health union. We have a sufficient um, um, health budget at the European level, which was unthinkable two, three years ago. So there is clearly a proof that uh, we, are, we, are, we, we are always managed to, to, to handle such crises. So this is the one thing. The other thing in a more proactive way is that Europe has also a track record uh, to, to, to sparehead, uh, so the, the climate goals, the climate change. I mean, I think our contribution at the, for the famous Paris Accord is undeniable. And that's why we think that we have to go ahead. Uh, the von der Leyen Commission has defined already at the beginning, even before the pandemia, uh, two main political priorities. One is green transition. The other one is uh, digitalization. I have to say, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine has proven in particular this uh, green transition because uh, our Achal heel is uh, dependency on raw materials and the vulnerability on this. And uh, uh, in, in that respect, uh, uh, so say the, the renewable energy efficiency becomes more and more an issue. Uh, and this boosting investment initiatives. And in this way, the, the uh, next generation EU is, is uh, created. And uh, that's why we have decided to spend at least 30% of our budget for the green transition. And uh, OK, and for the first time, we have the opportunity to raise money at the capital market by issuing bond. And one third at least of these bonds should be green bonds, making us the biggest um, uh, green bond issuer in the world. At the same time, setting the standards, which I think is also important because uh, we have uh, a very um, high level of uh, monitoring, uh, transparency, traceability of green investments. And uh, I hope this becomes an international standard. Have you, though, discussed this with your you know, counterparts in, in places like 
Jakarta, uh, where they, and also perhaps in Malaysia as well, in Kuala Lumpur, because they are concerned, you know, they're concerned about the EU's stance about palm oil and the use of it as a, as a biofuel. So that's been a real sticking point now for some time, at least for our two biggest countries of Indonesia and, and Malaysia, who are the dominant producers of palm oil in the world. Well, we will certainly discuss it. Uh, I'm on the beginning of my trip uh, to the region and uh, deliberately I started it here in, in, in Singapore uh, because I see here a very natural alliance uh, in terms of understanding what is needed. And of course, also what we are discussing here, what we are discussing in Europe everywhere is how to, uh, to organize this transitional period. Uh, nobody knows and can say exactly how long such a tra transitional period lasts and it differs from country to country. There is always also in terms of energy production a mix. But I think we are all clear and we should be clear about the direction we have to head on. And this is uh, so say addressing our climate goals, reducing CO2 emissions. And of course it's not a, a single avenue. It's, it's a complex uh, activity and uh, we need pragmatic, uh, tailor-made solution, but we should also be clear and committed where uh, we have to go. And this is the message I will pass to, to everybody because uh, this is uh, what we have all agreed on the different uh, COPE meetings and we will do so in the future. Well, I would guess that, you know, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta would say that palm oil as a biofuel is one of the ways forward. I will see and I will discuss it with them. Again, there are different views, but decisive it, what are the, uh, the results at the end of the day to reduce our CO2 um, uh, emissions. One of the things that you've mentioned now also in this uh, lovely talk with you has been, you know, your, your European values. So, European core values, what are they exactly? It's uh, about mutual respect of uh, human rights, freedom of expression. Everybody can pursue its own interest, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so it's a combination of, uh, of uh, many things which apparently makes us rather attractive as a destination not only to visit us but also to live. I have to admit many Europeans are not aware about these very good living conditions. Uh, so we have do you think they take it for granted? Do you think Europeans yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. I mean many of us, including myself, uh, I mean we are living in peace uh, for we haven't uh, experienced something else so that's why for us, for many of us, it's such a painful experience to have again a war in front of our doors to see the pictures. I'm living in a rather small country, Austria, but from the east part to the west part, the, the, the distance is uh, uh, longer than from my part of the country to Ukraine. So it's, everything is rather uh, uh, close to each other. And, um, and this is why I think uh, also in that respect, the war is a game changer for many of, of our people in Europe. I must admit that for us who are outside of Europe, what you're saying does come as perhaps a little bit of a surprise because we see Europe as being where World War I started, where World War II was definitely took place, um, the Balkan Wars, and now Ukraine. That seems like quite a bit of conflict. Well, we have, I mean, if you count the conflicts in the world, unfortunately, they have significantly increased. And that's why I think all the ones, again, I repeat myself, who are committed to uh, multilateralism should stand up, speak up. I mean, we are, if you look at uh, the global map, in reality, a minority. And so we have to defend our uh, way of living and to help others um, getting a similar perspective. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, what we are doing, what we are doing in our own interest, which is, uh, I think, defendable and understandable, but I think also in the interest of many other people. And I'm sure that I, I, I find a lot of understanding, support and um, 
commitment also here in the region. Final question, Commissioner. With these European values, though, do you hold them so dear that if, let's say, because you are also, you are also the budget chief, you're the EU budget chief, and you're here also to encourage people to lend to the European yeah. Union for, to fulfill your perspectives, your goals. If a country came to you that did not share your European goals and values, if, let's say, for example, the junta in Myanmar came and said, well, we're willing to buy some EU bonds, some EU green bonds, would you accept that? We are issuing the bonds via our uh, primary dealer network. I, I don't know exactly, I have to admit, uh, uh, final buyers. But of course, we have an interest that uh, our so-called shareholders are those who are committed to our values. Commissioner, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you.